Good evening. Welcome to the Edward M. Kennedy Institute for the United States Senate and to our beautiful Senate chamber. To the Henry M. Jackson Foundation, thank you so much for your partnership and support and help in making today's program happen. And to City Councilor Tito Jackson, where are you, Tito? Oh, there you are. How can I miss you? Um, it's really an honor to have you here with us tonight. And we are, uh, thank you for your leadership. Thank you for your participation this evening. We're also looking forward at the end of the evening to having Massachusetts State Senator Eric Lesser with us as well. I want to thank our moderators, Mike Dean and Lauren Dzinski. We appreciate your participation this evening. But most of all, I want to thank all of you. Thank you, those of you in the audience. Thank those of you who are participating remotely. Really thank you for participating in tonight's event. Since opening to the public a little over a year ago, the Kennedy Institute has hosted many interesting programs, but tonight's program stands out in a very special way for me. This is our first ever youth town hall. My late husband, Senator Edward Kennedy, said once that the future will outlast all of us, but all of us live on in the future we make. You are the architects of the future of this great country. And tonight, you'll be able to tell us about your vision for that future. You'll have the opportunity to express your views and to have your voices heard. And I can't wait. And having a program like this is really exactly what we're all about here at the Edward M. Kennedy Institute. And it's exactly the kind of thing we hoped would happen in this, this space. It's a space where generations can acquire a deeper understanding of the workings of the United States Senate and of our government, and can be inspired to engage in the civic life of our nation. And the Kennedy Institute is delighted to be in partnership in this effort with the Henry M. Jackson Foundation. Like the men for whom these organizations are named, both the Kennedy Institute and the Jackson Foundation are dedicated to education, service, and public dialogue. We also are committed to bringing people together to focus on and engage in the critical issues of our time. I like to think that Ted Kennedy and Scoop Jackson would like this collaboration. They served together in the United States Senate for 20 years. They hailed from different coasts. They shared many views and they respectfully differed on others. They each ran for the Democratic Party's nomination for president. And a little bit of trivia, they each won the Massachusetts Democratic presidential primary. But as you know, they found their futures in the United States Senate, where each of them remained until the last days of their lives. So yes, I do believe that they would love this collaboration. It's now my great pleasure to welcome the president of the Board of Governors of the Henry M. Jackson Foundation. He's an accomplished attorney, as well as an, as well as an outstanding leader for the foundation. We are honored to have him here with us this evening. So please, ladies and gentlemen, join me in giving a big Boston welcome to John Hempelman. Well, thank you, Mrs. Kennedy, and uh, good evening, everyone. It's great fun to uh, fly five and a half hours across the country and share the salt water, except you've got the Atlantic and we have the Pacific. But that tells you something, doesn't it, about uh, this great country, and to have two great United States senators like Ted Kennedy and Scoop Jackson have the kind of collaborative relationship they had for so many years in the Senate. So I'm here tonight to welcome you on behalf of the Henry M. Jackson Foundation. For more than 30 years, we've been trying to pursue the legacy and advance the legacy of Scoop Jackson on issues like foreign affairs, the environment, human rights, foreign policy, and most relevant for tonight, 
civic engagement, civil dialogue, bipartisanship, being able to have intelligent and articulate differences of opinion and yet come together to make progress. Our foundation is very, very pleased to be partnered um, with Mrs. Kennedy and the Kennedy Institute because we had two beloved United States senators who, as a key part of their public process, knew how to work with their colleagues who had different points of view. You don't hear much about that in the Congress today, but it's something that we need more of. Both Ted Kennedy and Scoop Jackson would cross the aisle to join forces with their Republican contemporaries in the Senate to get important legislation done to advance the American agenda. Senator Jackson spent 43 years in the Congress. That's a very, very long time. But Senator Kennedy spent 47 years in the Congress. These were men who loved that institution. And let me tell you, I was fortunate to have been there part of that time. They loved it because it worked, because it represented the best of American democracy. So I was very fortunate to have been there in that period to see it work. Both Senator Kennedy and Senator Jackson were great proponents of bringing youth into government. Um, the staffs of those two offices, probably the average age was under 30 for a good part of the time. You know, there, were, there were some senior members of the staff. I think I can remember somebody who was 40. Um, but there were a lot of us young folks, um, idealistic, and then rewarded when our idealism was actually put to work in doing the nation's business. Senator Jackson said to a lot of young people, he said, quote, my advice to you is be a participant, be involved. In this way, you'll enrich the nation and you will enrich your own lives. So congratulations to all of you who are here tonight I know a lot of you are already involved in your communities, so it's great fun to have you sitting here in front of me on the floor of the United States Senate. Um, as part of our interest in advancing the Senator's legacy and really educating people on the virtues of leadership, the, the Jackson Foundation has published a uh, small book. It's out in the, in the lobby, so please take it with you. It's called The Nature of leadership, um, lessons from an exemplary statesman. I like it because it's got big print, it's got lots of pictures, and it talks about vision, and it talks about wisdom, and it talks about diligence, and it talks about transparency, the kinds of characteristics that make a great leader. One of my memories, one of the, the great virtues of both Senator Jackson and Senator Kennedy was they did their homework. When they went onto the floor of the United States Senate to vote, people paid attention to these two men because they focused on their job and they worked really hard and they knew how they were going to vote on a piece of legislation. Even a minor piece of legislation, they knew how they were going to vote. So it's this heritage of these two great men that caused us, the Jackson Foundation, to join with the Kennedy Institute to put on this program tonight. And, you know, we're hoping that this partnership between our two groups helps empower you and helps empower the youth across the nation who are participating remotely in this program tonight. Um, you know, together, let's seek to better understand each other and each other's points of view and move on, as I said, to do good business for our nation. So thank you very much for participating. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce a champion of civic engagement and bipartisanship, Councilor Tito Jackson from the Boston City Council.
Let's give it up one more time for John and the Jackson Foundation. Let's also give it up for uh, Vicki Kennedy. We can feel your husband every single time we, uh, we walk in here. My name is Tito Jackson, and uh, the Jackson Foundation is actually not mine. Um, actually, I'm, and I'm not related to Michael Jackson for any of the people who, in here who are now disappointed. Um, I, I am so happy uh, to be before you. It is so critical that young people are involved, stay involved, um, and actually elevate what we're doing here uh, in politics. Um, we, we need you. Uh, my message to you is a message that has never been said here before. My message to you is turn down for what? Um, I'll, I'll let you know what that means later. Um, <laughs> but we need you to step forward um, and continue Black Lives Matter. We need you to step forward and to continue to advocate for uh, trans rights and ensuring that people can love who they want to love. We need you to step forward and hold us accountable uh, to ensure that our brothers and sisters are not going uh, to jail for nonviolent drug offenses and that we legalize uh, marijuana in the state of Massachusetts, uh, which disproportionately puts uh, men of color in poor communities uh, in jail. We need you to continue uh, to participate and actually engage, right? So if there's some people who you don't like to see, uh, there's a person I don't like to see who has a nice little comb over I have to see every single uh, night. We need you to step forward and run. And in particular for the ladies that are in the room, we especially need you to step forward and run and be part of this. And I wanna, I, and I'll, yes, can we get it? Okay. Okay. And the reason why we need you to run, and I'll, I'll tell you, every single woman I've ever, ever engaged with who wants to run for political office was more prepared than I was when I ran. They think about it. They actually uh, measure a lot more before uh, they cut. We need your voices. And sisters, women of color, we especially need your voices uh, at, at the table. Um, I also would, would just note uh, shortly that um, it's always been young people who've changed this country, right? Every social movement in the United States of America had young people involved in it. So when you look at Martin Luther King, he graduated from high school when he was 15 years old. In his 20s, he was right here in Boston walking around and doing stuff, including meeting Coretta Scott King. Um, and so it has been young people who have taken us uh, to that next level. And as a young person, when I was going uh, uh, to University of New Hampshire, I walked into a room much, much bigger than this, about 3,000 students. And I turned around and I realized I was one of the only black students in that room. I had signed up to go to University of New Hampshire where there were 12,000 students and we only had 54 black students. That meant I went to class every single class. I just want to let you all know that. I had to attend every single class. But in all honesty, it allowed me and gave me an opportunity uh, to actually be the change that I wanted to see. And so we started an organization called the Black Student Union with seven people. And that, set, that group of seven actually went forward and got 4,000 signatures to actively recruit more students of color to have uh, active recruitment of women of color at our school, uh, to have a pre-orientation for students of color uh, at our school. And you know what? That was in 1994. Um, <clears throat> and in 2016, instead of 54 black students, we have 550 black students at the University of New Hampshire. So I would submit to you, young people, your condition is not your conclusion. Where you are today is not where you will end up. Uh, tomorrow. And the only way that we get there is if you step up, not ride the sidelines, if you push too hard and go too fast, you will change the world, you will change our city, you will change our state, and you will definitely change our nation. And again, I encourage you uh, to continue uh, doing what you're doing and uh, turn down for what? Thank you so much. I'll toss it to uh, Lauren and our moderators. Thank you so much.
how it is. Here we go. Alrighty. Sorry, I just want to make sure that I'm going according to the schedule here. Uh, good Why? evening, everyone. <laughs> uh, as millennials ourselves, uh, both myself uh, and Mike Dean here, uh, are thrilled to be with you tonight. My name is Lauren Dzenski. I am the author of the Massachusetts Playbook for Politico, I'm, as well as being a reporter for Politico in Massachusetts. Um, and if you don't subscribe to that morning email, you should right now, please. As it is the only morning email one should read. Uh, I'm Mike Dean. I am WGBH's State House reporter. I'm on the older side of the millennial spectrum, I think. So hopefully uh, you won't kick me out if I sound stodgy and old. We'll try not to. <laughs> I also have the privilege to host the Kennedy uh, Institute's uh, regular trivia night that, that we have downtown every couple months. So please check that out. Um, yeah, please do make sure that you filled out those surveys on the tablets. I think pretty much everybody has. And uh, remember, this uh, isn't exactly like the real U.S. Senate in D.C. It's high tech. You're allowed to have your phones on. Uh, and so please follow the conversation. We're using hashtag youth town hall. Tweet it. Now let's get to it. <laughs> well, like I said, you all took a, uh, a poll prior to being here, uh, either before you arrived or on the tablets you have in front of you or on your mobile phones. And uh, I guess we're going to go through the results of all of these polling questions and see how they are. Survey says. <laughs> well, this is uh, who is participating in tonight's conversation. Uh, and this is the demographics of the audience that is in the room with you. So it looks like uh, everyone, or what, 50% roughly is between 18 to 26 years old. Uh, lots of Democrats here. Look at you guys. Well done. Well done. Yes, it's remarkable. I, I'm, cur I'm curious <laughs> about those other ones. I guess, uh, well, it, honestly, it's the orange section that I'm interested in, so maybe we can focus on a few of those and see where the you know, independents in the room are, are looking at trying to get their voices heard. Uh, you know, racial categories, I think that is no surprises for this kind of crowd here. But again, we, we see the diversity that you know, in towns like Boston and then any urban areas are really the, the university areas that this town brings in. Uh, it really goes across the board. Although most everyone is from New England. <laughs> but we have our Seattle area folks, uh, so thank you for there joining us there. Excellent. What is next? We can go on to the next. Apologies. Uh, let's get to the meat of the conversation. Uh, we will e read each poll question one by one and reveal its results. Uh, after each reveal, we'll turn to all of you for your thoughts. We want to pick your brains in the nicest way possible. Uh, if you would like to comment and share why you gave the answer you did and you are expected to explain your answers, uh, you will show your work, please and thank you. Um, we have a member of the team to bring you a microphone so that everyone can hear you. Uh, remember, we are live streaming this conversation, so do not start until you have a microphone. Um, and be aware that people are watching, in a good way, in a good way. We'll have about 10 minutes per question, and uh, if we'll call on you, you know, raise your hand, make yourself known. Please you know, say your name, your age, if you're comfortable with that, and we'll, uh, we'll move on from there. So, the first question. Lauren, would you like to take the, the honors? Uh, what, how closely are you following the presidential election? And it is very closely. Who would like to talk about why you are following, following this race so closely? Please raise your hand. You, Iowa. It's a, oh wait, it's not Iowa. Louisiana, sorry, I couldn't see the bottom out. Hi, I'm Jack Lovett. Um, I'm closely following it because this is my first presidential election I'm voting in, so it's, uh, I wanna make sure I'm educated on the issues, but also it's an intense election. It's kinda hard to not turn this one out given the candidates we have on the field. And also, I just wanted to add, uh, I am subscribed to your Politico Thank playbook. you so much. <laughs> if I can ask another, in between the survey questions, how many in the room here is this your first election that you're voting for president? That's pretty good. And so how about the second one, number two? Do you guys vote in 12? All right, and anybody what about in third? In, in 04, well, no one cares. All about. right, all right. You're on the higher end of the millennial spectrum. We'll count you in. Excellent. Um, what about rarely? Who, who is really not following this race at all? Explain yourself if you can own up to it. No one would admit to it in this room. <laughs> I don't see why not. I don't know. Millennials like to talk about things, right? We like to talk about ourselves. It's all right. Um, okay, let's move on to question two. Something a little bit 
Uh, How closely are you following other federal elections in 2016, such as U.S. Senate and House of Representatives races? And this is very interesting, you think a lot, and this really shows you where the mindset of a lot of people are. They're watching the president's you know, race, it's on TV every day, it's, it's Trump this, it's Hillary that, it's Bernie, it's everybody else. And you don't really get that much of the down ballot races. Here in Massachusetts, we don't have any really hot races right now. We have real down ballot legislative stuff, but there's no US Senate. Um, I, the congressional races don't seem like they're gonna be that competitive this year. That might explain a little bit of it. Um, but I mean, is anybody, would anyone say they are really closely following? Who's not 11.3? Who, who, in which race is it? If it's it's really gotta be somewhere else, like Maryland or something, right? Bernie fan, you. He has a Bernie. Uh, yeah, model. I'm. I'm Lucas. I'm. Uh, go to UMass. I'm following the Florida Senate elections with Alan Grayson. Um, the Southern California uh, representative um, election and the one in Pennsylvania. Oh, wow. Um, yeah. So. Staying busy. Now, why are you following those races specifically? Well, I'm a Bernie fan, so. Um, if Bernie doesn't win, I want to make sure that we can get more progressives around the country and not just here. So, th so that's a really interesting statement. I'm really glad that you said that because one of the questions that I've kind of had as an observer in this race is that with Bernie Sanders supporters and Trump supporters to a certain extent too, a lot of the people that are engaged by the campaign aren't necessarily, you know, they're not, they're new to how the process works. And so one of the things specifically with Bernie Sanders with some of his proposals, like, you know, making college tuition free and, you know, other things, so much of his proposals will rely on passage in Congress and, and making sure that it's not just the executive branch. He has to be backed up by the legislative branch. And so I've, I've always been kind of curious to see to what extent Sanders supporters and Trump supporters and kind of everyone understands that, you know, Washington gridlock isn't resolved by just removing the top, right? You have to go down ballot as well. I think a Sanders supporter would respond to that saying that that's why you have to build the movement. You have to have a revolution. And right now it's centered around his campaign. I'm very interested in what Senator Sanders does. You know, if at the end of this convention he goes through and uh, Hillary gets a nomination, let's say, <gasps> what does uh, Bernie Sanders do next? You know, how does he keep this momentum? There is obviously a huge a um, bit of, uh, of just inertia that's following this, especially with the youth vote and the, the issues that these people are interested in. And you know, we see figures like Elizabeth Warren, you know, like Bernie Sanders, who can carry that torch and how they do it and where they do it, not only in 2016, but now in 17 with a new president and a new Congress. Those are very interesting questions, apparently. But we'll see how many people care all that much versus the uh, the, the sexy presidential, you know, election that we're so having exciting. right now. So exciting, it, but it's local politics that really matter. Uh, informal poll, how many of you think Hillary Clinton, should she be the nominee, should pick Bernie Sanders as her VP? Who thinks that that's a good idea? Raise your hand. Wow, awesome. What about if Bernie gets the nomination, should he pick Hillary as his VP? No. What about Elizabeth Warren? Yay! There's always a Massachusetts connection. Fantastic. All right, let's move on. What's can we get question, question three? Question two? We'll do it live. Uh, the presidential right. candidates are addressing issues that are important to me and other young adults. Agree or disagree? Uh, and it looks like you know, somewhat agree is just over half. That seems about right. Strongly agree, a full third. Wow. That, that's very positive. I'm yeah. quite surprised by that. Is um, it the college thing? <laughs> no? I somewhat disagree at 12% and strongly disagree at 2.8. That is remarkably positive from what I'm seeing. I think that if we were to take a national poll of you know, people of all ages, uh, that green and yellow uh, pie parts would be much, much larger. Um, anyone want to speak to that? Anyone who does think that things are being addressed over here? Why so positive? <laughs> or negative? Uh, <laughs> my name's Sarah, um, and I must somewhat agree. Um, so I'll jump in on that front. Um, I think, Lauren, you asked the question about college, and I'm excited that it seems like there's some conversation on the trail around the cost of college, um, which I have student loans. I mean, that's something that's really personal to me, and I'm glad that the candidates are talking about it. 
Um, but I worry that in some ways that's where the conversation stops. I feel like folks haven't really been digging in on a lot of the other conversation we need to have about higher ed. Um, and I personally think we have a lot of work to do to go from taking these institutions that historically serve the few and now serve the many. Um, so I fall into a somewhat agree because I think we've had the beginning of a conversation, but I think there's a tremendous amount of work we need to do. Um, and I'd like to move beyond just that quick sound bite around how do you address tuition and other costs. What, so what specifically do you want to hear? I mean, it's hard to, you know, whittle it down into kind of a sound bite. That's kind of what I ask, what I'm asking for. But, you know, what are you looking for? Yeah, absolutely. I think there's a number of things. I mean, I think one thing, there's been huge increases in the number of folks that are getting through the, the gate of the post, you know, um, post-secondary institutions, but not as many getting across the graduation stage, right? So I would personally love to hear the candidates talking about those barriers that folks face once they're on campus. I mean, I think we have a lot of work to do around emergency aid. I think we have a lot of work to do around um, what we're teaching in our institutions and whose history that is. Um, I think we have a lot of work to do around really having a deep conversation about what it's like to have an inclusive campus that meets the needs of students who are also parents and students who are working full time. So I really just want to hear more on that front. Very good. Uh, what about people, uh, you, yes, someone else. My name is Winston. I, uh, my, my answer was kind of mixed on that because my favorite candidate dropped out of the race. It was Michael Rubio. And I love how he used to talk about preserving the American dreams and make sure that dream sustains and be an access to the future generations. As of now, I think um, Bernie Sanders is kind of doing a good job in terms of giving a uplifting message, like increasing minimum wage and make college affordable for everyone. And the issue of minimum wage is, is very important, not only for me, but also for most people around my community. That's why sometimes I, I listen to Bernie. Very good. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Anybody in some of the strongly disagree section? Anyone have some burning issues they wish were getting more traction? Today's student. <laughs> will soon be yesterday's student as I graduate in December. But, Congratulations. Um, thank you, I appreciate it. Um, so I actually didn't vote because my iPad or whatever, the tablet is oh. not working. So but I, I guess I would say somewhat disagree. Um, Sarah kind of touched on this, but there is a lot of talk about uh, the financial institutions in college, but what, and there's a lot of talk about the economy as well, but no one seems to t be talking about the connection between those two and how higher ed and ed in general is preparing um, us for the modern workforce and how it's creating equity and opportunity for all Americans and not just the virtuous cycle of the elite class. So my thing would be, you know, it's not just about um, student debt, but it's like, we're the future, as you guys said, of this workforce, and how are we preparing for the future? Fascinating. And from where are you graduating? Uh, Northeastern University. Congratulations. Go Thank Huskies. you. Yeah. Another Today student. I have, I have a related comment. Um, I'm also a senior at Northeastern University, um, and I think we are really lucky to go there because Northeastern focuses so much on experiential learning. For those of you who don't know, we do things called co-ops, where you take six months, work full time while in school, and Northeastern does such a great job of integrating that into the curriculum. And I think I would love to see more conversation around creating those opportunities for more people because being able to work and really learn what you love to do and what you don't like to do can help and develop those skills so that by the time you graduate, you're really ready to contribute in a meaningful way to the work that you're doing. Absolutely. Hawaii. Uh, my name is Neil Wittridge. I am a senior at Suffolk University. Um, I would say I somewhat disagree as well because uh, something that concerns me is not just, um, well, civic engagement, civic education for K through 12. Um, I think the current status across the nation is, is, uh, is lacking um, a lot. Um, so I would love to see candidates talk more about that. Just wait for the mic. Take them both. Too many mics. Thank you. Um, so one topic that I find interesting that hasn't been discussed so far, to really much of a degree, is environmental issues. Um, I think there's been a little bit of discussion about it, mostly as it relates to pipeline votes. But I mean, it's one of the biggest issues that faces everyone, right? We talked about the global sea level rise. 
um, we went through the whole Paris uh, climate acts and whatnot. And after that, it just kind of fell off the table. So we're talking a lot about these short-term discussions, but there's a whole lot that needs to be chipped in um, for more of a holistic viewpoint. You know, the environmental is tied into the economy, is tied into the education, and it doesn't seem like there's much of a focus on making it all work so much as just making one issue, you know, um, gain some momentum. So love to see more environmental stuff. Absolutely. Instead of building the wall. Right. Vermont. Oh, you're next. Uh, thank you so much uh, for inviting us and allowing us the opportunity to voice some of our um, civic engagement. So I'd like to kind of uh, also share um, a concern that I had echoing the sentiments of um, two colleagues here now. Um, so I'm a research assistant at the Global Development and Environment Institute at Tufts that actually does take a look at a lot of those issues and I also am in the uh, somewhat disagree category because I agree with you. I think a lot of the presidential candidates are talking about short-term effects to fix climate change. And I think integrating into the education system, promoting these human design thinking, new ways of um, fostering education, innovation, and entrepreneurship are really going to be one of the ways that can respond to addressing these global challenges that we have. And so you, it's exciting to be here because I think um, this room is filled with a lot of innovation and a lot of ideas of um, how we can address those issues and um, it requires a lot of reform. So thanks. Absolutely, good point. All right, up there. Can you hear me? Yes. Good. What's up everybody? Uh, I'm James Mackey. I'm a community organizer at Teen Empowerment and a lead organizer for Opportunity Youth United Boston Community Action Team. And so I said uh, strongly disagree uh, because I work in low-income communities and there is 5.6 million young people that live in, in low-income communities who are disconnected from work and school. Um, and if we give them more opportunity, uh, then the, the environment that they live in, their community, uh, would become a better place. So I think that uh, I, if, they're, if they can have more discussion around you know, young people, uh, 16 to 24 years old in low-income communities, um, they can, young people can really benefit because if you give them opportunity, uh, they'll create opportunity. But they're being left behind, so we need to increase opportunity and decrease poverty in America by mobilizing young people around our country. Um, so yeah, that's it. Why do you think that discussion isn't happening? Follow up. Um, a lot of young people in low income communities are not voting um, and don't understand the power of voting. And so uh, there's a story that I'll quickly tell you. Um, I, I used to live in Columbus, Ohio, and uh, I had an opportunity to uh, meet with a representative that's campaigning for, for their seat again um, for 2018. And um, I introduced myself like, how you doing, sir? I'm James Mackey. He was like, where do you live? I'm like, I live in Boston. He was like, oh, well, you don't matter to me. And so instantly, Whoa. it's like, wow. Well, a lot of my family lives in Columbus, Ohio, buddy, and now you probably just lost all of their votes because of what you said to me. So with that being said, I think that politicians or, or, or candidates that, that uh, know that a lot of young people in low-income communities are not voting, um, they don't want to go to those communities um, that are not voting because if, basically if you're not voting, what can you do for them? So I think what needs to happen is I think that if candidates really want to, you know, get the attention of young people, uh, because there's 5.6 million young people, that's a lot of votes that can sway your way. Uh, I think that we should, politicians should be um, educating young people more and trying to get on their side rather than not, hearing, not hear them at all. Good point. Well done. <laughs> Anyone else have anything to add? Otherwise, we are on to the next one. Back here. Thank you very much. I, maybe I should stand. I uh, fully echo the gentleman's comments on that because I've been working on the Bernie Sanders campaign, Feel the Burn, um, <laughs> very much. Um, and I've been in six states uh, canvassing, phone banking, et cetera, working on this campaign. And there is so much power waiting to be unleashed 
from the youth and from my fellow millennial generation, the democratic establishment just does simply not understand that we are ready to fight, that we do want progressive causes at the forefront. And my main issue, I strongly agree that the campaigns are talking about what matters because campaign finance is right at the top of the list, whether it's wealth and income disparity, the climate, minimum wage, you know, parental family leave, health care. You know, most of us believe that we should join the major industrialized nations of this world who are doing it very effectively for much less than we are. And we say, why not? Why do we have to let the drug companies and the insurance companies run our lives? Why do we need to, you know, allow the elites of this country, the wealthy, the well-connected, the influential, to just own everything? You know, I like that Bernie says, you know, you can't have it all, okay? So majority of Americans believe in some of these major issues that we care about, but because of campaign finance, because, you know, in modern presidential elections on the national stage, you have to beg millionaires and billionaires for money. And Bernie's proving through his donations, $27 average, that if people come together around these issues on the grassroots, you can send that message that, hey, we don't need your money. We can win the right way. And if he wins, or if he doesn't win, it is a vindication. He's already succeeded. It is a vindication that we can do things correctly, that we don't need to, you know, just pander. And the government has not been responsive to our needs. And so that has to change. None of these other things matter. None of these other things will get reformed if we don't get big money out of politics. That's it. Thank you. I think, uh, gentleman from Hello. Maryland. <laughs> All right, there's, there's state little name tags everywhere. Oh, they can't see them, can they? Right, um, <laughs> just making sure. So Go my on. name is Angel, and I, 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 I simply, I, I really understand the point that you've made, and it's very well noted. But d my one counter to that is that we've seen uh, in states like Florida and the whole Stop Trump movement that they spent upwards of $100 million, and somehow it has an influence on people are voting. He's still winning. Uh, I have the luxury and it was the privilege of being able to work in the legislature, and I can tell you that I have yet to see one instance where someone's donation has influenced how someone votes, whether someone takes a meeting. Most of the people that I've encountered have an open-door policy, and that's just the experience that I have. Uh, I would fall under the strongly disagree category uh, adding that because I feel like, uh, as someone mentioned earlier, the conversation has always been simply about how, uh, uh, how expensive college has been, but it hasn't been about why college has been as expensive as it is. They don't talk about uh, the nitty gritty issues of, of, uh, of uh, we talk about executive pay, but we, talk about how, we don't talk about how uh, some of the uh, presidents get paid uh, exorbitant amount of money, and you see that. Uh, whether it's at a public institution or a private institution. Uh, the example I always give is the President of the United States makes $450,000 a year. And I like to think he probably has the toughest job in the world. But then you have a president of a university making $1.3 million a year. And frankly, I don't think that matches up to the description of the job. So, I mean, is it the only reason why college costs have gone up? No. But do I think it's a contributing factor? Absolutely. So that's what I have to say. Who are you working for? <laughs> Rep. Petroselli? Excellent. All right. Anybody else? Someone here? else? Who else? Hi, everyone. My name is Haiti Castaneda, and I'm representing here at Boston. Um, I would like to see more of a focus on immigration reform. Um, I feel that it's a very touchy subject. Um, in all the presidential elections, I've seen that it's been more of a method of using to gain, um, you know, the votes, but I don't see a strategic uh, way to solve the issue. Um, being, being that my parents are immigrants, I definitely struggled with that a lot um, in terms of paying for school. Um, and that's something that is very frustrating because I know that I'm smart enough to go to school, but then again, there isn't a, a path to help somebody get to where they are. I think it's our human, um, it's our res responsibility as humans to help others get to where they want to be as a, because that's who we are as a country. We, we help people get to where they want to be. 
I mean, everyone wants to be part of the American dream. So it's very important to reform immigration um, to something that will be, just help others get to where they want to be in their life. There's another in the back. So, the gentleman from Pennsylvania. Sean, oh, there it goes. <laughs> I'm only 15 and possibly the youngest in the room right now. But as Ooh. a youth representative, I get to see growing up a lot of changes in school, and a lot in my high school as a student. Now, I am president of my freshman class, and I am proud to say that I can't do it alone, and I rely on not only myself to just be the strong leader that I have to be, but also to take into account of making sure that I'm doing what I'm supposed to do, and I'm doing what's right. And the main thing I like to talk about here is just generally youth appreciation and also just watching kids do horrible things. Now, I've had a lot of friends in school, a lot of friends, even in our high school, a lot of good kids. But for the single, not so, about five to maybe three percent, do horrible things like drugs or alcohol abuse. You just, the list goes on. But to say, I feel like candidates seem to bring in these matters more, it sometimes feels like it drops off the table. You know, when we watch these old educational videos like, Drugs are bad for you, stay away. It just doesn't drive the same message home anymore. You know, when I grew up, you know, my dad and my mom would tell me, you know, the horrible things that their friends and things that happened to well-off people, famous celebrities, even people that they looked up to at the time who abused these kind of things. And as a young, as a young kid, I'm, I see these things happen. I've seen a lot of my friends People who I respect, people I see on the daily, they're great kids, but you get to see them kind of change. I mean, I mean everyone. I mean, there's a lot of people here who aren't aware, and there's also a lot of people who are aware. I mean, there's parties where drug abuse happens, alcohol, even in your own home. The worst part is, like I mentioned earlier, it's not really touched back anymore. To see candidates really bring in the younger generation, even just kids in high school, to really just go back and drive the message home would mean a lot to everyone. And getting to watch this as a kid sometimes and not being properly just even get to even look at the subject and just watching old videos doesn't really help anyone. Just mostly, oh wow, that can happen? Doesn't really affect me, I mean, I'm here, I don't care. You know, that's what other kids are thinking. And I just sit there and I'm like, it's real. Right, I think you have a very valuable point. If you, yeah, well said. And 15. If you expand upon that and go a few years down the road for some of those kids, then we come to uh, the opiate addiction crisis that we're dealing with right now, and that has come up uh, on the trail here and there. And uh, I think what you, the situations you're describing is how some people end up that way. And obviously, opiate abuse and opiate addiction is a much broader type of issue that needs to be dealt with in a whole spectrum of different uh, ways to correct it. But um, would you say that you've heard much from these candidates on drugs in general? Has anyone really seen that? I mean, we've seen some, some stuff in New Hampshire, some stuff when the Republicans were here about opiates in uh, you know, this area. But do you, how, do you guys think that drugs in general and drug policy has played a big role? Have you heard much about that? No? Well, that, add it to the list, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I would have to say personally that like I mentioned, candidates will mention it here and there just to make it sound a little bit, you know, like they, they, they're, they're kind of concerned about it, but I feel like it needs to be more of a pressed issue, meaning that it needs to be driven home again like it once was. And like I said, as a young kid, it's really unheard of for someone my age to really speak out about this. You know, mostly the kids that have a voice, they're afraid because, oh, you're speaking out? Oh, you must be this, this, and that, and a cuss word here and there. It's just, it's just how it is in high school now. I mean, it's how it always was. I mean, you remember all back in your old high school days, freshman, sophomore, whatever. I mean, yeah, you speak out, you're going to get mocked. But you got to do what's right. You got to stand up for yourself. You are the whistleblower. You control everything that you do. You are the cause, and you are the driving force. You got to send it home. You can't just sit there and watch things happen. 
And as president of my class, I want to remind them that we care, that we want to be there. We want to make sure that people are not only having the enjoyment of school, but also the lesson and the friendship and just the brother and sisterhood that we all can form through school. Great, wonderful. Thank I hope you. you're considering a career in politics. That's quite the speech. Oh, believe me, I am. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you so much. Thank you. I think we should move on to the next question. Absolutely. Number four. What most influences your support for a candidate? Wow, almost 90% to Pac the Pac-Man-sized uh, plurality here. <laughs> this is true. This is true. This is not what the real world looks like. Uh, but it's fantastic to be here with all of you because this is excellent. Um, for those of you, for the majority of you that responded that issues uh, are what most determine uh, your support for a candidate, what specific issues? What drives that? Who wants to break it down? You, up in the rafters. Hey, I'm Rachel Fagan, I'm uh, from Dorchester. Um, a two issue candidate for me, it's entirely uh, climate change, environmental policy, and the women's right to choose. And, and who of all of the candidates do you feel best represents your stances on these issues? No one. <laughs> this is a disastrous presidential race. <laughs> Can we quote you on that? Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Well, I, so as far as the 90% of you who say it's the platform, um, I guess we want to break that down further. Does that mean individual issues uh, like she just expressed, or just a grasp and having a platform, having a collection of issues that this man or woman is of my mindset. Because I definitely think that on the Republican side, we are seeing issues in the Trump platform that we have not really seen uh, in previous campaigns. And a lot of the energy that's going on on the, the Republican side is because Donald Trump is talking about trade. Donald Trump is talking about immigration in a different way. Donald Trump is ta taking either fresh issues that Republicans haven't really dealt with in a long time on the campaign trail, or he's taking very interesting kind of, you know, populist tax uh, towards these established issues. And a lot of people, I think, would answer that on the Republican side. Uh, again, it goes to uh, the Bernie Sanders side of things, where if it's economic you know, e equality that you're after, that is a platform in and of itself. Um, but I'm a little curious about the, how small the candidate's personality is. Here, because, we have, we have someone who's on. interested in it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, go, go, yeah, basically. Jedi mind meld. Let's do it. What's your name, sir? Michael Champagne. I'm from the University of Nevada at Reno. I guess that would be like two years ago. Um, but <clears throat> yes, in looking at this, you know, it's really, it's really great to be amongst a lot of like-minded people who are very dedicated and care a lot about uh, our country and not just the populist attitude. Um, but I do agree with you that Mr. Trump has raised some questions that the Republican Party has not really had to face in a long time. Um, but that being said, I think that both parties are being able to avoid questions about our country for the longest time. And for the Democrats, in my opinion, we haven't really seen them address issues dealing with education in a way that created actual change. A lot of it has been saying they're gonna do something and then avoiding it. And at what point does our K-12 education fall far enough to where the populist mentality can take hold and just become mainstream? And my greatest fear is that we will no longer have students filling rooms like this or people of a certain generation filling rooms like this to talk about issues that truly matter beyond the simple populist image. And I would be interested in opinions or in statements regarding that as far as the millennial generation is concerned. I know that we have a certain number who are, yes, very dedicated and who are here today, but there is also a large number who are at home who got this message but decided, ah, eh, politics aren't really for me. And I don't know if that's through education or through more community involvement, but you know, I guess I'd like some, I'm not clarification, but really anything you guys have to offer on, on how we can get more people like us to these events. That's a good question. 
Um, I mean, I, I definitely think, and you know, anyone else can weigh in on this. I'm just gonna talk because I have a microphone. Um, but I think in terms of getting people engaged and involved, it's really important to establish a community, right? Like. You're in a room full of like-minded people, at not necessarily similar issues or stances, but you all are passionate about something that relates to what someone else is doing. And when you know that you have people that you can turn to when, you know, say the news is breaking that IndyCar is pulling out of Boston, you know, you can pull up a couple different people that you can text or, you know, you're out to dinner with people already and you, you can have these conversations that maybe you wouldn't necessarily have in any other settings. I think creating these communities of sorts and, you know, surrounding yourself with people who are passionate about these issues and want to talk about these issues helps expand that to a certain extent. But you know, there's always that process of, you know, how do you find these people? How do you reach out? Um, I think social media is really important. Uh, hashtags, Facebook, uh, it, it sounds really ridiculous and I feel like it's kind of like beating a dead horse to a certain extent talking about like hashtag, hashtag activism. Um, but I gotta admit, like hashtag Black Lives Matter opened up my eyes to issues within, you know, the black community and communities of color that I didn't know. Um, and, and I think that's really important and it, and it shouldn't be understated or forgotten. Um, but I'd love to know, you know, what other people think about, you know, how, how do you get people involved and how do you stay involved? You look like you've gotten a few people involved. What, what's, what's the... Are you live streaming this? What's the, yeah, the secret to success? So, yeah, uh, I work with young people. I work with community organizations. I work with politicians. I work with police officers. I work with everybody. Uh, and I'm willing to work with anybody in this building. Uh, so with that being said, I think one thing that we have to figure out is like what what are people's organizations um, core values and what what is it that they really care about and we really have to align those core missions core values uh, to really drive uh, a mission or, um, to change uh, the communities uh, or issues that we talk about so uh, one thing that I do when I go speak to young people about, you know, Opportunity for United and why it's important for them to understand the importance of voting before I actually ask them to, are you voting or are you voted? Uh, I, I ask them about issues that takes place in their community. If they had one thing that they would like to change around their community, what would they change and why would they change it? So I remember a young person was talking about, you know, how in Boston the, 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 the schools are not funded as, um, as well as the schools in uh, uh, Wilmington or, or uh, other schools outside, out, 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 outside uh, the, the greater Boston area. That's a prime example. So who, who's in position um, to make the decisions around the funding streams that, that's for BPS, right? And, and are you or is your mother or is your father or, or is, is the community really engaged in who's supporting uh, those, those issues that we need for our community. So I think it's really hitting it at the core, uh, really aligning people's missions, values um, together and saying where does uh, community organizations, uh, politicians, um, what issues are they working on and how can we get them to work collectively together to have a collective impact. Great, thank you. We have a bunch of people. I saw your hand first from the striped shirt over there in the buttons. Who is well, I kind of, I, I think we can keep going on to the next question because the next question does play a lot into this kind of stuff, what we're talking about. All right. Um, and we can get back because I think a lot of the comments you guys want to make will be even more pertinent to question number five, uh, which is how, if at all, do you see yourself engaging in politics in the future? And this is how you guys answered and this is a lot of what we were just talking about here, you know, with 45% of you saying working with a community group. That could be an awful lot of things. As the gentleman up there you know, said, he's, he's an organizer, he's been doing this. Um, you know, it, 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 is this accurate to what you see with people? Do you get 44% of people in a room like this wanting to work with you? Right. Good answer. Yeah. <laughs> All right, uh, who wants to weigh in? We had a bunch of hands earlier. I, I, I want to go for people who haven't spoken before, so apologies if you already have spoken, but we want to get some other voices in. Uh, you in the purple shirt back there. Uh, so I'm one of like the three Republicans in here, so... Uh, Congratulations, really welcome. Thank you. Uh, so I think... <laughs> <laughs> Round of applause. Uh, so, and I'm, I'm the state chair for the College Republicans, and one of the things that we worked on this year was getting uh, the students out and getting involved in campaigns and just meeting with candidates. And I think once you talk to someone who's running for office, uh, it's very easy for students to identify with their values and platform. 
and then getting them out and working and volunteering on campaigns is relatively easy. Uh, like last weekend, we were able to get five or six kids out to work on a state senate race. Uh, which which one? Mean, uh, Pat O'Connor. Okay. So um, just getting people out and involved and meeting with candidates is something that kind of encourages engagement in politics. And I mean, you tell me how many people are getting involved in a special senate, uh, special election for state senate in Massachusetts, right. right? So I think that it's it's just about getting people out and involved in the field, and that always encourages engagement in the future. Well, I'll tell you this, as far as a state senate race goes, if uh, major education policy is going to move in this state, it's probably going to go through the senate as a catalyst. And so if anybody who, you know, we talk about the federal level in education you know, in the grand scheme of things, it's really state legislators, state legislatures that are going to do this. And they do that because they have state legislators who win elections because they have people like you working for them to get them there. And those are the decision makers who are going to kind of move these policies forward. I think that most of the state house people in this crowd would agree with me uh, to a certain extent that there's a lot more happening in those buildings than, you know, there's a lot of talk going on in DC. And yes, when Congress moves, it moves quite a bit, but you, you can't get a lot of these types of issues that we're trying to scratch the surface of without states taking the lead. Uh, one thing I did want to just point out here is that only 8.4% of you said that you would engage in politics in the future by working or volunteering on a campaign. And that seems fairly shocking to me in a, in Especially a campaign Especially when year. more than 20% want to run for office. Right, yeah, exactly. <laughs> or it's, yeah, so more of you want to run for office than the combined <laughs> work for an elected official or volunteer on a campaign. I think that might be because we're in a group of overachievers here. <laughs> <laughs> you skipped a couple steps, but I, I like the ambition there. Uh, in 13, and almost 13 and a half of you said that you don't see yourself engaging in politics in the future. So this is a weird room for you to be in. I kind of figured that would be the sliver and yeah. the rest of them would be a little bit bigger. But did anyone answer that they don't see themselves engaging? In the corner. Are you, are you just done with this? <laughs> Hi, I'm Hannah Whittier and I'm 15 years old, as Sean is. And We lost you at 15? <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't see myself in politics because as of right now, the, there isn't really Politics may push things in the future, but it's just not the way that we need to go because the people th today don't listen the way they should. Like, the kids don't get to see the way they should. Like, my father being a politics teacher and teaching about government and all that always states that the kids are the future and all that, but we're not. Nobody pushes the fact that being younger, we have a lot to say, but nobody listens. That there's no point in going into politics if that we don't get the chance to speak as of now and that... Like, I don't know if it's just our school, but we don't have a way to put that out. Because we've got kids who, as of Sean and a lot of other kids, who would be great presidents and would push the facts that a lot of you speak to today. But nobody has the time or the way to listen to us. I think, very good. I think there are some counterpoints here. I saw some <laughs> hands shoot up. Chevron shirt. Hello. Um, I'm Kristen. I'm from Stonehill College. And... I think I completely hear you on that. I um, actually work with Generation Citizen, which you might have heard of. They work in Boston, but I started the chapter at Stonehill College, and so we work in Brockton High School. Um, and when people think of politics, they think of like federal politics, but that's really the problem because we have to really look at the local level. And that's, I think that's what one of the issues is about why people don't participate in government, especially at the local level, because they think politics is just at the top. But with Generation Citizen, I work with students in like, making sure that they know that their voice can be heard even if they can't vote. And showing them, we talk about, like we have an hourglass, I don't know if any of you are familiar with it, but we talk about community issues and um, kind of what someone was saying up there, what if anything we would change in your community and then we take action on that in the local community. So specifically the class I'm working with is advocating for a safe space for homeless youth in Brockton, just like they have one in Boston, we don't have one in Brockton. So they're advocating for that, meeting with the mayor, meeting with um, different homeless shelters and influencers around the city. And it's showing my students that they do have a voice even though they're only sophomores in high school and they can't vote yet and it's showing them that like the local level of government is a laboratory for the national government and if you're involved in the local level then you can kind of seep into the top it's not like a process where you get involved from the top down but instead from the bottom up and I think that's a real issue that needs to be addressed within civic education in the youth there's a very famous quote that says all politics is local and I think that that very much pertains to that Good evening, everybody. I'm Cynthia, and I'm actually a graduate student at 
UMass Boston. And I actually, um, guys who are, I think I'm just going to address um, this young lady. Meet Ke Keandre. He's actually part of the BSAC, so it's the Boston Students Advocacy Council, um, who sits in the, um, the school committee for Boston Public Schools. So if you're thinking that you can't make a difference, our students do have a voice, so I want to encourage you to look into culturally responsive teaching in your school. What does that look like? and get your teachers to start listening. Students do have a voice, and obviously there are future under students. He's 16, by the way, so you have a year to catch up, don't worry. It's not late yet. Um, when we're looking at, you know, we're looking at this and how do you engage in politics, and you know, as a teacher, as an educator, um, we go into, guys, I need you guys to watch the news, and I need you guys to stay, you know, stay um, connected to the issues, and I think one of the biggest um, shortfalls that we have right now is that we don't respond to our, teach um, to our students' needs and creating that, and at a K to 12, at a young age, I think you just said it as well, you weren't aware of some of the issues. So if you're not aware, there's not really much that you can do. So how do we go back into our schools, into our K to 12 curriculum, and really get that student voice from the get-go so the student doesn't feel frustrated, so that they don't feel that they don't have a way to engage. So, you know, I'm super excited to be here with all of you guys because it's amazing that so many people want to push forward. So whether whatever issue it is and whatever political party you are, I know you're in the minority right now, um, <laughs> you know, just keep pushing along. I think student voice is definitely there in whatever platform, whether you're in obviously K to 12, grad school, master's program, whatever you're doing, just keep pushing along. I think we have, this is the chance for us to really make a change. So thank you to the Edward Kennedy Institute for allowing us to be here tonight. Someone in the purple shirt right there. All right, hi, I'm Ryan, this is loud. Uh, in addition to everything that the past two speakers just said, I would just like to add that in regards to the, the purple slice, whether or not you choose to be engaged or active in politics doesn't matter because politics will actively and assuredly be engaged in everything that you do on a day-to-day -day basis. So every day you wake up and look out your window and it's not just flames and cars tipped over, thank government, because that's what that does. But to, I would also add that um, in order to you know, help, help people realize that, that reality, we should uh, expand the ways in which we allow people to become engaged in politics. I, like myself, with Princeton, am involved in Generation Citizen and see passion in people every day. They want to get out and speak about the issues that affect them, whether or not they live within the conditions that these issues affect or just are enamored of the issues themselves. They want to become involved. So to that extent, we have to um, reestablish the connection that existed between the people in the office and the people themselves. And how do we do that? By increasing the power of the vote. And through that, you'll have people that become more active, that become more aware once they realize their potential. And I think that whether or not you agree with uh, candidates like Trump or Sanders, you have to admire the ways in which they've rallied these people who have forgotten the, uh, their obligation to participate in this democratic system we have because we need to channel those tactics in a positive way that helps everyone realize that potential once again. Thank you. Very good. I'm, uh, I'm, I, folks I'm upstairs. Okay. One up there before we move on? Sorry, guys. Good evening. Um, my name is Jesse Milberg. I am interested in this participation because what I think we're about to face in the millennial generation is a crisis of identity. What we continually fail to believe is millennial is more than just an age group. It's really a belief system, how we see the world, how we interact with it. And our, what I like to call earliest millennials, some people call the oldest millennials, um, are now old enough to run for president. And we continually see ourselves as students first. And when people talk about millennials, they think students. They don't think citizens. They don't think contributing adults. And I think that's one of the biggest challenges that we're facing is how do we talk about ourselves no longer as students, but as contributing members of this society in which we have the right and expectation to participate. You know, we have so much more to contribute than being a student first. The student can be part of us. We're still learning. We have doctors now. We have um, people getting married, having families. Not quite so many being able to buy homes, but you know, there's, there's a lot of, um, issues there, but it's the biggest challenge I've always seen is when we talk millennials, it, it's always someone that's less than. 
because they're not yet old enough to contribute. But I would challenge that. We, we can contribute. We are of an age group that can, and it's more than just an age group. It's really more how we see the world. And I think we need to, as a group, say, you know, we are participants. We are able and eligible to run for office, to participate in groups. And I think we need to embrace that. Absolutely, good point. Take one the other one from up there, too. Hello, my name is Nia Evans, and I'm with the Boston NAACP, and I am not a millennial. However, I made it into this room because youth has been redefined by this invitation as 18 to 40, and I am in that age group. Welcome. Um, so uh, we've, we've been on this question for a while, and actually a few people have said some things that I've been thinking about with regards to participation, engaging in politics. Um, and my immediate thought is how we define engagement to begin with. Um, it's, it's a little expansive up here. There are, there are five categories on this pie chart, uh, but there are definitely more. And so my immediate thought is not asking if you see yourself engaging in politics, but asking how people are already engaging in politics. And I think the the gentleman, Ryan, talked about this uh, just a couple of comments ago, saying politics is already engaging us. Um, and I would, I would add to that and say we are all engaging in politics in some way, shape, or form. And for those of us who do uh, various aspects of this work, it is up to us to figure out how that engagement is taking place beyond what has already been sanctioned. So beyond voting, uh, beyond working on a campaign, beyond uh, running for office, beyond working for a community organization. I, I believe if uh, some type of poll or survey were done, we would see that almost everyone has some type of conversation about some type of issue. And I would call on engagement. And then my next step, or my, my next uh, question would then be, uh, yes, as Ryan said, politics is engaging us all the time. How is politics engaging us? Um, because as I said, I would argue that we are contending with these issues every day, but it is questionable uh, whether professional politicians, whether uh, other professionals in politics are actually engaging with us in the way they should. Um, as an example, you mentioned Black Lives Matter. One uh, headline that has gone around recently is, if we're talking about Bernie Sanders and Hillary Clinton, we know that the Republican Party is not really engaging Black Lives Matter at all. Um, but even the engagement that comes from Bernie Sanders and Hillary Clinton is seen as transactional. So headlines that we have seen have said things like black li uh, Sanders and Clinton cares about black votes, but not black lives. And so what we would consider lack of engagement, I would actually say is savviness on the part of people who are not interested in entering a relationship that is not mutually beneficial, that is transactional. And there's an understanding that uh, if Sanders doesn't win, we won't hear from him over the next few years in any substantive form. Um, if Clinton doesn't win, we won't hear from her. And when I say we, I'm talking about those of us who subscribe to a Black Lives Matter platform. We won't hear from her in any substantive uh, form. So it does not behoove us to engage now if it's not genuine engagement. That's a very good point. Another one in the back. I don't know if this is on. Um, so I guess I'm, it's really exciting to hear all the different issues that are being raised, and that's really exciting to me in the election. And I think for me, so I, with my colleague, we work for an economic development consulting firm, and so we work with small businesses and nonprofits and uh, anchor institutions and municipalities in Massachusetts and um, across the U.S. And I think that, again, I would love to run for office one day, but I think that, um, you know, I have student loans to pay off and I would love to get an MBA and actually, maybe it's not very sexy in this millennial generation, but I believe in big ideas and I'm really excited about having potentially the first female president, but I also really believe in getting things done. And so I think that um, increasing what political engagement means and whether that means working in the private sector and understanding how that works and how um, you know, money flows and how that flows to low-income communities as well as to, um, you know, 
30 million dollar companies, which is very different than a hundred million dollar company. So I just think it's really important to um, increase the dialogue on both sides and to recognize that people come into politics from all different walks of life and all different avenues and that's what makes our country great. But I think that um, having more of a understanding about where people are coming from um, and also increasing opportunities like getting more MBAs to go into politics or having opportunities where if you are, a, you know, if you're somebody who works 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. and having opportunities to engage in politics like this or doing a phone bank, I think that's really important. Absolutely. That's great. Before we move on from this, I definitely, yeah, um, I wanted to ask, I'm, I'm sitting on the applause. Um, I want to ask this, um, where is it? 21.8% of you want to run for office and you think that's the, the, the future for you. It, who are you in the 21 percent? Show yourself. What are you going to run for? Okay, what are you, you going to run for? And how are you going to run for it? I mean, I would, like, obviously try to run on my ideals. And my ideals come from my family and the environment that I grew up in. So if I feel passionate about something and I actually want to do something to change it, I think that running for office is probably the most uh, effective way but obviously working in the community group is also a very good effective way but if I want to be that leader and want to be that voice for those who might not have that voice I think running for office and showing that people actually who care about these issues have the passion to go and run in and change the system from within um, shows that there really is the force that exists out there when you say running for office what type of office um, any type of office, as long as I can mayor, mayor anything, there. as whatever Water I can get. <laughs> um, but it depends on what I'm looking for at what time and who am I trying to represent. Hey, up top. Okay, well, complete opposite of what you're looking for. But um, in this room, I'm probably also in the minority because I'm pretty apathetic about politics. Um, I just came for a friend and, and to check out a cool event. But Welcome. It, thank you. Um, but I think everyone has a lot of good things to say. Um, and the reason I'm apathetic is not because I don't care about the issues, but because I think that the system as a whole is broken. Um, and like a two-party system. I actually just read a survey, um, I think it was done by Harvard, that it was like 50% of people don't know if they support democracy anymore. Um, and it's this idea that there's so much broken, and, and at least from what I've seen, we're not getting a lot of good change done. Things are so watered down that there's not an impact being made one way or the other. Um, so I guess those are my thoughts. <laughs> Thank you. All right, thanks. Uh, any of you in that 21% have an office in mind? Any of you dead set on? All right, we'll start this way and go back. Hello. There we go. Hi, uh, I'm Molly, and uh, I am a public high school teacher. I teach U.S. history and civics. And what school? I love uh, Norwood High School. Yeah. Uh, I love my job, uh, and I love working with students every day. Uh, but when you talk about people who are impacted by decisions politicians make, uh, public school teachers live and breathe that all the time. And I find myself very frequently, especially as someone who teaches social studies, um, a subject in Massachusetts that does not have a high stakes test attached to it, and therefore is often low on the priority list when it comes to things that need to be given more attention, funding, time and learning, et cetera. Um, it's frustrating to feel like it could be better, to feel like the students could be learning more, they could be more empowered, and it's really hard to make that happen. Um, so I would potentially see myself either running for um, local office, school committee, something of that nature that could have a direct impact on local education policy, or as you were speaking earlier, to, uh, to state senate and state level office that actually could reprioritize some of the things that are going on in our schools that I don't think are actually benefiting students. Thank you. Who else, Who else is running for office? In the back. He's feeling the burn. Either of you. Oh. <laughs> Hello, Ashley Brown. Um, I 
didn't at first necessarily think of me as an ideal candidate to run for office. However, when I look at the number of women, and then when you peel that back, the number of women in color in elected office, it is devastating. Right now, um, I know this year in particular, the Massachusetts House of Representatives is losing its only African-American woman. Um, and then I am um, Gloria all, Fox. Gloria Fox, yes. And then um, Donna Edwards just lost her United States Senate race. And we have zero African-American women in the United States Senate. So I, I just, I think that you don't necessarily always think of yourself in that role, but when you look at our halls of leadership, they are often old white men. And that is unacceptable given even the diversity that I see in this room. Right. Up there. Anybody else want to start their campaigns? No, wait, no, no, no. He's got it up there. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, oh, I was right. letting you finish again. We're going to keep doing this. Um, Let him keep his own. <laughs> I'm just going to hold on to the, just kidding. Um, so I'm not a native of Massachusetts, but one day I would really love to run for the Massachusetts State Senate. Um, and to your point, ma'am, I'm very passionate about education reform. And I think that at the local level, that's one of the greatest places to have an impact um, as you said to your point about the local legislatures pushing through education reform, um, and then there's been a lot said. They're That's trying the, to push through education reform. Right, right, but I mean, yeah, we'll see how that goes. I think a lot of that has to deal with how we've kind of forgot what compromise means uh, across the board. I know we learn it in K through 12 education, but um, we kind of let that fall by the wayside as we get more and more um, interested in other topics. Let's see. The, uh, and to your point, ma'am, about the apathy in politics, I think that that's a very large issue in our country and that we face. Um, it's hard to see the wheels turning in the system, and I think a lot of people will say that the millennial generation is very much all about instant gratification. Um, and not being able to see that tends to be an issue in why they don't become engaged. But to my last point about being engaged, it's hard to be engaged in something when that thing doesn't reflect who you are. The minority community is not reflected in our politics, unfortunately, and it's not for lack of trying, and it's not for lack of will, it's for lack of, I guess you could say, knowledge of how to get there. A lot of people talk about privilege in our generation as well, and a privilege, and knowledge is a privilege, and being able to know what steps I would need to take in order to hold a seat in office, or to hold an office, or even what office is an electable position, are all parts of what I believe and want to reform in our K-12 education. We spend so much time talking about our national politics and our foreign affairs, but at what point do we look inside? Our country is massive. We have millions and millions and millions more people than some of the largest European nations, and we, we, we constantly look to them and say, how come we can't have free this, free that, or socialize this? But to a country of hundreds of millions of people, it's not that easy to just kind of have a fix-all but anyway, I'll, I'll end with this. Um, I would absolutely love to run for state senator here one day, and this is my adopted home state. What district do you live in? I'm not from Massachusetts. No, I'm kidding. Um, I live up in Brighton, and so it's technically a part of Boston, so I, I'm not really sure um, that would be a part of the things I need to look up. What district is that? It's Brownsburger. There we go. All right, who else is running? Hawaii. Thank you, uh, Neil Richard again. Um, I would run, I would start running for um, school committee uh, because I strongly do, uh, well, I'll take it from there, um, but um, I strongly do believe that civic education is the key to, uh, or a partial solution to many of the issues that the country faces. Um, if I could just kind of go a little spiel. Um, Your stump speech. I, I do have my stump speech. We invited this, didn't we? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Well, the, the U.S. Census reported in 2014, 80% of people aged 18 to 29 didn't participate in midterm elections. In the same elections, total voter turnout was the worst it had been in 70 years. Uh, with increasingly polarized politics, it's no coincidence in the past five years, we've had two of the least productive Congresses in our nation's history, with the possibility of a third at the end of this congressional session. Um, 
going back on the figures, it's almost an entire demographic not being represented in our, um, in our country. Um, and its research shows that um, vote influences public policy and so civic education, I'm not sure if there is conclusive um, evidence for this, but could possibly increase voter turnout. Um, and we do need, I think the approach we have for civic education is um, a bit, um, I don't know, I guess traditional, I'm not sure if that's the word, but um, we need to focus on service learning and um, making people understand the core issues in their community uh, if I may, I, I work with um, at-risk youth. I'm from, from Lynn, Massachusetts. Um, I had a friend, uh, not to get too personal, but I had a friend, uh, and I repeat, a friend, um, two weeks ago arrested for, um, he, had, he was possess, possessing uh, fentanyl and heroin. Um, and I, I strongly believe that civic education isn't just about you know memorizing things and facts and history and knowledge. It's about uh, decision making. Um, so I, I strongly believe that this person who, you know, made very bad decisions, but also is a good person. Um, if he had the right education, he would have made the right decisions. But yeah, thank Great. you. Great, thank you so much. Can uh, love the stump speeches. Can we just keep Sorry. them to like 30 seconds? Because a lot of you guys want to run for office. Yeah, we'll go around the horn a it. little bit if you can keep it brief. But I want to get through the rest of the questions. Seriously. So. Uh, oh, over here, yes. Hey. Is this on? No. Uh, I'm Mike. I live in Somerville, but I originate from Chicago. And I'm in the minority here with the working or volunteering on a campaign. So I've worked on... My first campaign was Obama's Senate seat in Illinois. I'm from Chicago. Throwback. So, yeah. And, um, the veteran so, in the room, then. <laughs> <laughs> so, Ashley, or the guy in Brighton, if you guys need uh, someone to work or volunteer in your campaign, I'm here. Um, but I don't, I don't actually plan on running for office. My dad is an elected official in Chicago, and I got to see firsthand how he was able to um, bring a lot of uh, uh, this divided Chicago community to rally around the first black mayor of Chicago. And so that's why I vote every day, or that's why I think about voting all the time um, and try to get other people to vote because it's not so much about what we want. You know, I think the millennial generation has the stereotype of being, um, it's, you know, all about us and we have the option of doing this and that. It's also about our past. People voted for some of these progressive policies or policies that you agree with now but if it wasn't for them standing up for this, you wouldn't be where you are today. So I think that's a really powerful thing to think about. Um, there's a lot of people that stood up for things way back in the Civil War, the 1960s with the Civil Rights, and you know I think there's, there's still more to do, and I think uh, you gotta keep that in mind, is that there's a lot of people that fought before us. We need to continue to do that. And that's by volunteering for a campaign as opposed to running for office, yeah. right? Oh, right? Gotta start somewhere. Yeah, <laughs> all right. That's great. All right, so I think well, if we can our, move on. Oh, one more in the back? Yeah. All right. Uh, see, I don't have a stump speech. don't really have a platform either. Well, equal time to the Republicans, so we got to have to let I you mean, know. I mean, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and no platforms work for our front runner so far, so hey, it might work for me as well. And uh, yeah, so for me, it's really about the motivation to run for office. Uh, I'm a first-generation citizen. I, I think I'm privileged to grow up in a country like this, especially seeing what some of my relatives have to deal with back home. And I think that it's important to give back to the community after... Uh, seeing that my experiences and ensuring that the opportunities and, and uh, experiences that I had are, are there for the next generation and years to come. And I think that's kind of the only reason I'd ever run. And I'm not sure if it's either town, state level, but that, that would be the reason why. Where's back home for you? Uh, so my parents are from India. I'm from North Attleboro. Cool. Great, thank you. Oh. All right. Um, One the more? next question, six. Oh my gosh, everyone oh. wants to run for office. Sorry, guys. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> you all guys right. can all just work on your stump speeches. We'll come back to them. but. Um, yeah, have you ever worked, volunteered for a campaign? So this is similar to where we were. Now, a lot of you said that you didn't want to do it again in the future, but 44.3% <laughs> of you said that you have and would like to again. So <laughs> I'm a little confused. Maybe that's the, all the people who are running themselves, uh, who are open to all the <laughs> options. Um, the four and a half, or seven percent, seven and a half say you would not do it again. Ooh, I want to know who is burned out <laughs> from campaigns. Who has volunteered and but does not want to do it anymore? And the other, the so other half of you zone. have not. This is a safe space. Well, this is about yes. half and half, yes and no, have worked on campaigns before. So, yeah. What was that like? Um, 
Yeah, it's, it's, um, it's process. I've been working for, volunteering for campaigns for about 10 years. Which ones? My first campaign was Gloria Fox's campaign. Um, it's, it's, it's tiring after a while, especially when you're introduced to a grassroots level of volunteering and a lot of the change that you're fighting for, there are systems that are built against the very change that you're fighting for. It's tiring, it's tiring. And now that um, I'm of age to own my business, I believe that the power is first in the people that you galvanize behind the candidate, then it's in the money. So. That makes sense. What were you doing on the campaign specifically? You said grassroots, but what does that mean? Uh, <laughs> knocking on doors, holding signs, making phone calls. Um, oh, the basics. Then, then um, the, the latest campaign, um, well, some of the later campaigns, Elizabeth Warren, um, Obama's campaign, um, you know, those were more, uh, had more of an intricate role in the campaigns. Um, so it's, it, I probably range from, I have a wide range of experience with working with campaigns. But as far as like the volunteering, <laughs> not for me. <laughs> We're watching the pie chart just move as he tells no. us how horrible it is to work on a campaign. Oh wow, is it moving? Really? No, it's not. Oh. <laughs> we should re-poll you guys as you exit and see what you think now. Uh, anybody else, any, any thoughts on volunteering? Alaska. Or experience? Hello, I'm Kristen again. Um, so I was actually in the 13.1% that said I'm not interested in working for a campaign, which might su be surprising since I'm very passionate about this. Um, I'm not only just one of the independents in the room. We had mentioned that before. I am an independent. Um, I'm more involved in the judicial aspect of government, so I can't, I'm not really like affiliated with one party or the other because I try to stay neutral. But I'm also really... Uh, like obviously very proactive for civic education. So we actually just did a mock election at Stonehill and I was, we were, I was on one side and I found myself trying to put myself in the middle and like explaining to people how, like the two different sides. I wanted people to be educated voters and make the decision for themselves. And I get that like when you work for a campaign you're trying to like inform them, but I'm like more, I want to give them both sides equally and give them both sides and let them make the decision based on like information from both sides and not just one side. So that's kind of why I'm not interested in working on a specific campaign in general, but instead just promoting people being involved and looking to get educated and just like voting basically. That's a good point. And this kind of raises another side question that I think relates to this. When we think about campaigns and working for a campaign, I think it's important to understand that campaigns don't necessarily just mean a person. They're also issue-based campaigns. Does that change your reaction? I mean, you could, you know, you could be a part of Freedom Massachusetts, which is currently fighting for, you know, the transgender public accommodations bill, which is, you know, a really hot topic uh, at the state house. And Senator Lesser, I think, can speak to that a little bit. <laughs> he's he's in the room now. Um, but so so I think the nuance between, you know, a a you know specific candidate versus issue uh, is is significant to note. Are we moving on to question seven? I think we should. All right. Uh, we're going to get through these in the lightning round, the last three questions here. Boom. What barriers do you and your generation face when trying to get involved in the political arena? So these are all kind of negative answers, and these are what you guys think are the, the most negative. It was set up you that pessimistic way. pessimistic Except for seven and, no, seven and a half of them say none. There are no barriers, which, th that's great. These are the same ones who are running for office, and everything's rainbows for them. <laughs> uh, yeah, it, it, let's say 9% not interested in the political process. Again, why are you here? 24.6% candidates, <laughs> that's harsh. Uh, candidates and elected officials don't want our opinion or involvement. Now we definitely heard a lot about that, about how the issues on the campaign trail are not what we think they should be talking about or they're not applicable to you know, our generation or our communities. 32.8, uh, you know, even more, in opinion or involvement wouldn't make a difference. And I think that kind of speaks to some of the uh, problems with the system that some folks have expressed here, whereas you know, money is in it, and it's set up against our better interests. And Apathy. Hopefully some of the conversations we've had here have dissuaded some of you from thinking that way. Uh, and 18% don't understand the political process uh, and issue areas discussed, which hopefully, again, we can correct with some of the, uh, what we're talking about here. Um, is anyone, does anyone feel strongly about any of these, these two lower chunks? 
candidates and elected officials don't want our opinions or that your opinion wouldn't matter? Okay, well, which one? I selected other because um, I've actually at this point I've done about four internships at the state and local government level and one barrier for me was that a lot of these internships aren't paid or aren't paid well and for me that's an economic barrier where I really do want to get involved in government, I really do want to get involved in politics but that means at times less money to put towards my student loans, less money to buy things that I need so I think that's a huge barrier or even, even some offices I've worked in, you know, it's much easier to get access when you're upper middle class and, ha and can take the time out to get a job that doesn't require money. And so I've had a great internship experiences, but I also know that there's that kind of reminder in the back of my mind where I also need to make money to pay for my education. Absolutely. That's it. And Absolutely. that's a huge, huge, huge issue. So thank you for bringing that up. All right. Striped shirt. Hello, my name's Michelle. So I strongly believe in the one that um, some people just don't understand the process. Many of my friends and me sometimes are actually interested about politics, so we'll go on YouTube and search up clips about the presidential campaign. And we'll get very confused because what starts out as something talking about the issues and what we, what we feel that matters soon turns into more of a big spectacle of who can, who can make a bigger deal, who can get their big message out there first. And not to say that that's not wrong, if you can get your message out there in the biggest way possible and show people, that's a good thing. But most kids, my friend commented, me, commented to me, he said, how is this helping? How is this doing anything? And it does seem a little disconcerting when you see someone on your iPad just yelling at another person. But those, those issues are important and those debates do help us, but I feel we do need more classes in school. We can ask some of our teachers, but this should be a class where we can sit down and say, okay, this is what we saw, and I'm very confused seeing all these people yelling at each other. What does this mean? Like, there needs to be some sort of connection, because kids in my grade, I'm also a freshman in high school, do really care. It's just, it's very hard to understand sometimes how everything's so far away and not just about the issues, sometimes about the show of the issues, can really help and make a difference. Absolutely. Yeah, we, we have a question on, <laughs> on civics education. We'll, get to, we'll see the results from that a little a while from now. But uh, I wanted to, Purple? What was your name again? I'm sorry. Ryan, hello Ryan. again. Uh, I would just like to say that in addition to civic education, one uh, reality that I don't really see indicated up there isn't necessarily that our candidates don't want our opinion, is that they can't receive it. I, again, I don't believe there are enough practical ways that people can become involved in their process. The average normal American is you know, too immersed in their own day-to-day -day activities, whether it be their job, kids, a family, um, really anything else outside of the immediate realm of politics that prevents them from being immediately involved. But once again, I would like to say that uh, an easy way of reestablishing the necessary connection would be bringing more power to the vote and maybe just speaking procedurally, some way that could be done is uh, adjusting the delegate system. But besides that, uh, power to the people. Ooh. All right, let's do one more response um, and then we should move on. We've sure. got a limited amount of time. Right here. Hello. Hello. Good evening. I'm Keandra McClay. I am, I attend Edward M. Kennedy Academy for Health Careers. Um, and I am the Vice President of Boston Student Advisory Council. And also, <laughs> I'm the President of the Board of Trustees for Youth United for Animals and the Planet. And working with some of my peers within high schools, I understand that students do not feel, they do not understand, the, they're not interested in the process because they don't understand it. And they need to be educated with the, on the process in schools and understanding how their voice counts. Because they do not understand that just by doing the protest, which we recently did for budget cuts, that counts, that matters. By actually going out and registering to vote before leaving high school, that matters. Talking to elected officials, district, city, and state matters. And they don't understand that that matters because they feel that their voice is being shunned or being overheard by the adults. And I find it um, 
not a conducive environment when you do not have teachers who's willing to say, well, we need you to actually speak up on how you feel your school should go or how you think your country should focus on certain issues like Black Lives Matter or trans issues because they have students within my school who feel very uncomfortable just to go to the restroom or very uncomfortable just to talk in front of some of the teachers because we have a majority um, Caucasian staff within our school. Great. That's great. great we, on, we only have about two, three or four minutes left, so I want to make sure that we do see all the results. So uh, question eight, and I apologize if we didn't get to anyone's question or comment on that. Um, something that Laura and I can talk about ad nauseum forever. <laughs> How do you get your information about political issues, candidates, and races? Politico, right? <laughs> Uh, it's a, a healthy over a third for print and online. Oh, even more so, 35.2 for social media, Twitter, Facebook, Reddit, and other platforms. 27% television and radio, uh, word and mouth of other kind of coming in the, the rear there. Um, uh, obviously, the big one here is that orange one, social media, Twitter, Facebook, Reddit, and other platform. If I were to be, if this was five years ago, I would have told you, but that's all stuff that's from print media posted online, but that's not the case anymore. Absolutely. It's original content, it's native to that platform. There are people, there are voices on social media that exist only on social media. We've seen movements uh, come and, and affect change through that. Uh, and I think that's, it's a healthy mix there. I, I, this is encouraging to me. I don't know how you guys feel about it. Um, anyone extremely happy or dissatisfied with the media when they cover politics? Lightning round. Uh, up top, way up top. <laughs> oh, yeah. We got a microphone up there. Oh, right behind you. Right behind you. Yep. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Parson Hicks. I'm a resident of Roxbury, and I'm also the fourth Republican. I heard someone down there say that there Welcome. were only three of this. Yes. Um, yeah, so I feel that the media um, has a bias. Um, and for me personally, when I see uh, the, I, I would call it the Trump obsession, I don't feel that he always gets a fair shake. And so I tend to come to the point now where as soon as I turn on my radio or as soon as I turn on the TV, if I hear Trump this, Trump this, and actually pretty ludicrous things are starting to be reported, I don't want to hear it anymore. Um, and so I think, you know, for me as a Republican, and it's probably uh, very well known that many of us feel that the media is biased, it's not something that I typically always rely on to get my news. And, you know, for someone with this position, too, I think uh, when I hear certain things reported, it's just very obvious uh, the bias in the reporting. Where do you get your news? Follow up question. Um, so I think it depends. We know that uh, print media hardly exists now. Um, so I tend to like to go on the web to, you know, sites like Boston Globe. Um, you know, I like main newspapers uh, uh, in addition to New York Times. Um, it just depends on um, if there's a story there. I like to go to the original one that usually comes from Associated Press. Um, and then again, I mean, I, I love listening to the radio NPR, but it's just, I think if you have a different opinion from the mass, particularly this state, um, you can very much hear uh, what I would consider to be biased reporting. Thank you. I personally pride myself on getting uh, criticized from the left and the right, which I have a pretty good track record, so hopefully I don't fit in that category. Well done, Dean. Thank you. The lefties hate me. <laughs> uh, anyone else want to weigh in? Otherwise, we should probably huh? scoot on. Oh, yeah, I think we, need to, we do need to move on All to right, number yes. nine, because I did want to get to the uh, number nine, which is the civics one. Uh, educating youth about our government leads to better functioning in democracy. So surprising. Uh, yeah, no, that makes a, a heck of a lot of sense. But I mean, we talked about this quite a bit before. I'm, I'm kind of interested to talk to one of those somewhat, somewhat agrees. Which um, is 11 There's no disagrees, but is anyone skeptical about civics education? Uh, I'll premise this by saying uh, I'm an independent who leans socially uh, liberal and fiscally conservative, um, but I'm skeptical by the bias in our education system. I believe that this state in particular, this numbers, these numbers don't surprise me. I think that this state in particular cares very much about education, but a state like Nevada does not so much. Um, and so I, I would want to assure that the civics education would be equitable across the entire nation so that everyone has the same understanding, but how do we make that fair? 
Um, I was a journalism major in school. I have a lot of love for both of your organizations. Um, Thank you. But I will say that the bias that exists in our country is natural. We all have opinions. Um, we did would just need to combat it more in order to make this a better functioning democracy. Very Thanks. Good. Okay. So we have one minute left. Uh, we have one minute, so I definitely think we need to move on. And this is the last Absolutely. question. It's a big, broad one, and um, we can hand the mic over to the senator after this. Uh, you want to take the sure. last one? Sure. Uh, Americans can create social and political change. 78.7% uh, strongly agreed. 20.5% uh, somewhat agree, and 0.8% somewhat disagree. Wow, so was there an absolute no option? There was a strongly disagree option, and no one selected that. So good job. It's a self-selecting group. <laughs> Again, uh, anyone want to break that down a little bit? No, no cool. strong feelings on whether or not Americans can change things. <laughs> In the back. I forgot to introduce myself last time. My name's Jared. I'm from Dorchester. I'm 25. And to your point um, about education, I have a soft spot in my heart for public school teachers because I went to Boston Latin Academy. I'm a very proud BPS product. And we were lucky enough, I was fortunate to have civics and to have AP government. And I don't know if the rest of the state and other schools and around the country, as the gentleman was alluding to, have the same standard of you know, teaching that we can apply to our own lives and the importance of education. Um, when it, to, to rope it back to, to my guy, with Bernie Sanders, he represents everything that I've ever cared about, and his values are my values. And so I've been inspired to get involved. I don't know if it's across the board, but I've met so many people, volunteers and otherwise, whose you know, fire is just generated. You know, they're on board, they're ready, they're good to go, and my friend Ashley and I are running this upcoming weekend to be at-large delegates to the National Convention this summer in Philadelphia. And th that level of participation to me is very important, just to be almost like outsiders getting inside and learning the process and what it's all about and really getting um, our demographics causes across and what we really want to see change. Great, thank Fantastic. you. Fantastic. Up top. All I would, um, I would like to say it's a pleasure to be here to see what's all the questions that's going on. I was actually going to bring this up on question number seven, and that is what do we consider as American? I mean, many, this is the most, uh, the U.S. is the most diverse country, and we have to keep in mind it's diversifying every single day. And a lot of people with different cultural backgrounds are not considered American. And that's, I think that has the f biggest effect that a lot of um, young generations are not going into um, a lot of campaigns, a lot of political change. And that is the reason that um, whatever that question considers as Americans cannot create a social and political change. Because we have to include everyone, no matter what culture they are or where they are from. We're all Americans. And I, I, am, I would like to say my dad is from Syria, and my mom was born here, but I am a proud American, and I would like to make change for the future. Wow. Couldn't have said it any better myself. Absolutely. God bless America. Uh, but seriously, thank you, uh, and thank you all. I think it is time uh, for Senator Lesser to come up and speak with us. But it's been a fascinating conversation. I, my big takeaway, education. Education is key. Well, Hi. I'm very welcome to, to, to welcome State Senator Eric Lesser. Uh, do you just want the mic and do it like this or the podium? So I guess it, it feels a little formal to be, uh, to be behind the podium, but uh, I guess I like the feel of this. This is a cool... Uh, a cool space. Um, I, I really, first I, I want to thank um, uh, Mike and Lauren. That was a cool uh, presentation. I ducked in kind of halfway through, but to, 
I know I'm going to regret saying this, but two big stars uh, um, who definitely have big followings at the State House, and uh, we, uh, you know, at times we can have a little bit of an adversarial relationship, but definitely respect uh, the work they do. A little bit of uh, uh, push and pull is natural in this business, but uh, you're two of the best, and uh, definitely two sources that myself and everyone uh, else goes to for, for information on what's going on, not just in the building, but of course uh, in the wider state and region. So thank you for, uh, for what you guys do, and thanks for today. And I want to give a, a really special thank you to, to Mrs. Kennedy and to the entire um, uh, uh, Kennedy Institute. Uh, this is uh, special personally for me. I actually, one of my starts in politics was as Senator Kennedy's page. Uh, in the summer of 2002, I was a junior at Longmeadow High School, uh, which is on the other end of Massachusetts, and I went down to Washington uh, to be a page for Senator Kennedy, and it was actually a, a very big time uh, to be a young person getting started in politics and be a young person getting started in Washington. It was right after September 11th. Uh, that summer, the beginnings of the debate over the war in Iraq were starting. Uh, there was a lot happening. Uh, there was debate about the prescription drug benefit and uh, patient's bill of, right, uh, bill of rights and, and a lot of other you know, really big issues uh, that I was just starting to learn uh, as a 17-year-old uh, coming from Western Massachusetts and kind of finding myself uh, in Washington for a summer. And, and uh, Senator Kenny was incredibly gracious to me uh, during that, that period. And I learned a lot from him uh, and from his whole team. So it, it's particularly meaningful to be here now. I feel like I'm kind of coming full circle a little bit, and it, it really means a lot. So, you know, I mentioned when I got there, I was a high school student, you know, just kind of getting involved in politics and kind of learning uh, the ropes, and I'm a millennial, uh, born in 1985, and what do we know about our age group, about our generation? You know, that, that group of people born basically after 1980 uh, is how millennials are defined. Well, we are now the largest generation in the country. We're larger than the baby boomers, uh, and it was mentioned or alluded to uh, by one of the comments uh, that was just made. We're also the most diverse generation in American history. We're the largest and we're the most diverse. We are also the highest educated generation in American history. But despite being the highest educated, the largest and the most diverse, we might very well be the first generation to have a lower standard of living, a less prosperous future in front of us collectively than our parents did. If you think about it, that kind of challenges the fundamental sort of compact that makes us Americans, which is that if you work hard, if you go to school, if you do what you're supposed to, uh, that you end up with a better life and a better station uh, than where you started. And I think that that's part of what fuels a lot of the frustration our generation feels about politics. And if you think about it, it's actually kind of understandable that we're frustrated about politics. We kind of came of age with 9-11, the war in Iraq, uh, and the Great Recession and the financial crisis and everything that came from that. So I think it's understandable that we have a little bit of a, of a kind of cynical view of politics and maybe sometimes a little bit of a sense that our voice and our station uh, you know, maybe doesn't get the representation that it needs uh, or that it deserves. But I think that the antidote to that is what we're doing today. And I really think that it's incumbent upon us as young people who are going to inherit the challenges we face to take on and to challenge that cynicism rather than to embrace it. Because frankly, the trendy thing to do right now, the cool thing to do, is to tune out uh, or turn off or walk away or leave the work to somebody else or to some other time. And so I just want to really encourage everyone to keep at it. Uh, I learned it from a very early age. Just the summer before I worked for Senator Kennedy, actually, um, we were faced in my town, a small town in western Massachusetts, about 15,000 people. We were faced with budget cuts that were going to lay off 40 teachers in my high school. And 40 teachers in a small uh, school system is a big, big cut. It was going to really change the quality of education for me and for my classmates. And I remember the principal called us all into an assembly, sat everyone down, and basically said, you know, Mrs. Morris, Mr. DeBurn, this teacher, that teacher are not going to be coming back next year. And 
I didn't think it was fair that 14 and 15 and 16 year olds should have to pay the price for bad decisions made somebody else, somewhere else, by somebody else. And so what do we do? We organize. We actually knocked on every single door in our town. There are about 5,700 doors uh, in our town. We knocked on every single one. We work with parents, teachers, and students to encourage, uh, uh, to plug that funding gap, to save those teacher jobs. And actually, you'd like to think that the whole thing is a nice, neat line, but the first vote failed. And those pink slips were sent out. Those 40 teachers got these pink slips in the mail. Uh, so I was young, I didn't know any better, so we knocked on every door all over again, put the measure right back up on the ballot. And uh, the second time it passed, and those 40 pink slips were ripped up, thrown in the garbage, and those teacher jobs were saved. So it was an early lesson for me that despite the nessiness and the frustrations of politics, and trust me, there's plenty of them, that this still remains one of the most powerful and important ways to make a difference and to help people. So after that, I, I caught the bug. I went down to Washington. I worked for Senator Kennedy for a summer. Uh, and then I joined the oh, Barack Obama's campaign in 2007 uh, and 2008. In fact, my job was, I was the lowest guy on the totem pole. I was in charge of carrying all of his suitcases around uh, during his 2007, 2008 campaign. Uh, we traveled to 47 states together, traveled over 200,000 miles. Uh, and actually, my joke uh, uh, was after 200,000 miles in 47 states, I never once lost a bag. So um, a little hokey, but, uh, but uh, after that, you know, when we did that, I met literally thousands of young people the same age as all of us in this room who were so excited about what that campaign was about. And more than Democrat or Republican or left and right, just about the idea that young people can get involved and make a difference and take ownership over their future. So anyway, make a long story short, I worked uh, for, uh, for President Obama for four years, uh, was there for some really incredible things. So whenever people challenge what politics can do, uh, I was there when the healthcare law uh, was passed and, uh, and, um, and saw you know, Mrs. Kennedy uh, uh, be there for the signing and all the work that went into that. I mean, what a fitting tribute to be here. Anybody who, challenge, who challenges the notion that politics can be a force for good, can be a force for changing people's lives. Take five minutes to just walk around the halls here uh, and I think you'll have that, that notion uh, uh, kind of wiped away uh, pretty quick. So uh, to kind of wrap it all up, I was itching to get home because one thing I kind of realized in Washington is, you know, as cool as it is to work for the president and as interesting as it was to be at the White House, real change ultimately comes from the community up. Uh, it comes from neighborhoods up. So I went home uh, to where I grew up and I threw my hat in the ring to run for state senate. And I would really encourage any of you who are interested in politics, just jump in there and run. Run for something. Whether it's school board, state rep, state senate, congress, whatever it is, just jump in there and run. Uh, there was, I had every reason in the world not to do it. Um, most of the people I was running against were my parents' age, uh, and I actually ended up winning by 192 votes. So whenever anybody says that one vote doesn't count, I remember on election night, thinking back to every person I spoke to, uh, to, uh, to get to that, to that margin of 192 votes, and now get to work on things that are important to us and to our generation uh, every day, which leads to the initiative we're running now in the Massachusetts Senate, which is a, our millennial engagement uh, initiative. And actually, Mike has written quite a, quite a bit about this uh, already. The idea behind this is rather than telling young people what we want as a Senate to work on, as a state Senate, we're going out and we're asking young people what they want us to work on. And so we've been doing forums all over the state. We did one in Lawrence last week. We were in Fall River. Did one in Springfield and Amherst. Did one in Paxton in Worcester County. We're gonna have one in Boston coming up. Did one in Quincy about a month ago. And the idea behind this is sort of no holds barred. Just let it rip. We, we post everything out on Facebook, on Twitter. We invite the community. And people just come in and they share their thoughts and they have a discussion. And so I'd really encourage all of you, if you're interested in getting involved, if you're interested in making a difference, to come join us, uh, to come to one of our events. We're going to have one in Boston in June. Uh, so we'll put out uh, all the details and we'll make sure 
uh, the, uh, the Institute gets all the details for that. Share your thoughts, share um, your feelings. Can't promise it's gonna happen, uh, but what we can promise is that we'll start the process of working on it. And I'll, I'll just conclude with one last you know, thought, which is, um, you know, I was born in 1985. Uh, I think I'll, actually a lot of you are a lot even younger than me, so we're born um, uh, even, uh, even more recently than that. But if you think about, just take 1985 for an example. If you look at everything that's changed since then, basically every sector of our lives is completely different. The way we shop is different than it was in 1985, the way we work, the way we communicate, the way we socialize, the way we travel. There's one thing though that isn't different, and that's how basically how citizens interact with their government. For better or worse, the State House basically works the same way now as it did in 1985. Lauren's laughing because you know this better than anyone. And frankly, the US Capitol works basically the same way now as it did in 1985. So just as we've seen transformations in all these other businesses and industries and innovations in the nonprofit sector, the private sector, we need to see a similar change and in innovation in, in our government and in our politics. And all of you are going to be the ones that change that and that think through that and that push the system to innovate and to adapt to how we operate and how all of us communicate and how all of us share what's important to us. So thank you so, so much for today. This is very uh, cool data. I love, I love uh, all, the, all the survey results and I'd really encourage everyone to just jump in there uh, and get involved because your voice can make a difference. Thank you so much, Senator. All right, we are pretty much done. Let me get my little closing spiel. The, uh, well, thank you all for sharing your thoughts in this evening and going through those votes in the polling. I think we all got quite a lot out of uh, the information and data that we went over here tonight. Um, yeah, the Institute will be sharing the results via social media, so if you want to check up any of the, the cross tabs, you can go in and uh, find all that on the Institute's website. And again, we have the hashtag uh, Youth Town Hall. Um, you'll have the chance to network at a reception following this right now. Uh, and please remember to take a minute to record a pledge to, a pledge to vote video and then tweet it using hashtag EMKI pledge. Again, shoot yourself a video of you planning to vote, pledging to vote, uh, we don't care for who, and then tweet it out with hashtag EMKI pledge. Uh, and thank you all again.